So with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, the barristers which will be speaking this afternoon on Landmark. First off is Matt Henderson, who is a, a bright star amongst our juniors. He's one of the hardest working young members in Landmark, and he, he's been involved with numerous infrastructure projects already, um, including offshore wind farms, fracking and coal. Uh, he was also involved in the Heathrow litigation for the Aurora Group, uh, and he uh, acted for North Somerset Council recently in the Bristol Airport inquiry. He, he's also dealt with the amendment to DCO's post consent. Um, Richard Turney is one of the leading juniors in our planning team. He practices in all areas of planning, public and environmental law, and he, he acted for National Grid on its North Wales Connection project. He's advised and promoted power station DCOs and offshore wind DCOs too. Um, that's when he's not appearing for the government in the High Court as an A panellist or promoting HS2 or working on, on other DCO projects like the A303 Stonehenge scheme, uh, where he uh, uh, had the misfortune of being my junior. Um, Jenny, last but certainly by, by no means least, is a, a silk in our planning team. She practices in all areas of planning, public environmental law as well, but she has a particular focus on judicial and statutory review challenges. In her most recent energy related case, uh, she represented Surrey County Council in an inquiry into an appeal for an oil and gas exploration scheme in Dunsfold. Uh, that was an appeal which was allowed by the Secretary of State last week. So um, enough from, from me, um, I'm gonna hand over to, to Matt. Great, thank you very much, Ruben. So my talk today is a, a scene setter. I'll introduce um, the energy security strategy uh, and, and then hand over to Jenny and Richard who will talk about consenting in a little bit more detail. Um, so new, new strategy, uh, fresh off the press, um, but what's the background to it? Well, I suppose three key uh, previous policy documents or announcements. Firstly, the energy white paper back in December of 2020. Uh, secondly, the consultation on the review of the energy um, uh, NPSs, and, and Richard will touch on those in uh, a bit more detail in his session. And then thirdly, the net zero strategy in October of 2021. Now, the initial focus through those three strands was really one of transitioning towards net zero uh, and the pathway to that goal and how energy fitted into that. But against that, we've got a series of external factors that we're all very aware of in the, in the very recent past and indeed in the present. The growing dependency uh, of the UK on foreign sources of energy, increasing global energy costs, and of course, the war in Ukraine and the effect that that's had uh, on those costs. And really the energy security strategy sits in between those two different compete intentions and tries, I emphasise tries, to mediate between them uh, to a certain extent. And I think really that's the first theme I would pick out from uh, the strategy. It is inevitably, as one might expect, high level. It is a mixture of both new and old. Uh, and by that, I mean more recent policy announcements that have been essentially repackaged into the strategy, uh, certainly in an attempt to present it as a more coherent whole. But it's that theme between um, those two competing interests that we see throughout each and every section. I'm going to talk through some of those sections now by way of introduction. So the first one, um, is just to set the scene in terms of existing policy. Well, what, what, what do we have? Well, of course, we've got uh, the MPPF, which we're all familiar with. I've pulled out there in the bullet points some of the key paragraphs, so paragraph 20 in terms of strategic policies, setting out uh, a series of strategic objectives in terms of the path and scale and design of development and for our purposes, ensuring sufficient provision of energy. Uh, then we get paragraph 152, another overarching um, policy objective with supporting renewable and low carbon energy and associated infrastructure and you need to read that together with paragraphs 155 through to 158 which provide more detailed policy and um, support for that objective uh, and i pulled out paragraph 158 in particular um, that deals with specific support for the consenting of renewable and low carbon development uh, in particular, there's no need to demonstrate need. Need is to be assumed, uh, and there's a policy imperative to approve. And I, I pause and I say, except, of course, 
uh, in respect of onshore wind turbines and the footnote which deals with that, the footnote to paragraph 158 which deals specifically with those uh, onshore wind turbines and gives what one might describe as more restrictive and, and lukewarm support and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Of course, sitting alongside the MPPF, we've also got national policy statements, and I've listed all, all of them, EN1 through to EN6 there. Uh, as I've already said, Richard will touch on that, and the consultation uh, concluded last year, and we're, we're waiting to see uh, where that goes. So that's the background, and then into the strategy itself. So the first key topic to pick out is that of energy efficiency. This is to some extent a reiteration of previous policy. I've given some examples uh, there in terms of the heat and building strategy, the homes upgrade grant, but there's also the introduction of specific financial measures to boost energy efficiency. Again, uh, I've given some examples in terms of dealing with the zero rate and a VAT for the installation of energy saving materials, uh, 450 million boiler upgrade scheme. Um, but what's perhaps of most interest for us is the idea of frameworks. Two in particular, firstly, improving energy performance standards. We had some subsequent announcements in May of this year dealing with that. And secondly, reviewing what is described as the practical planning barriers to increase in energy efficiency. Uh, and these seem to range across a number of different areas. At the more minor end of the, of the spectrum, we have things like glazing and listed buildings and improving energy efficiency in that way. Um, but also moving through towards uh, the consenting of uh, larger, larger uh, projects, larger renovations. Uh, and that's probably the second theme, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but the, the, the theme of speeding up the delivery uh, of energy-related infrastructure, whether it's under the 1990 Act or the 2008 Act. And it's probably worth pausing here on energy efficiency. This is uh, something that has caused um, perhaps some controversy that the CCC, for example, described these as weak provisions, um, inadequate in terms of their support. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say, even on a, a fairly cursory reading, there is certainly more to be done in that department. So the second topic is one of oil and gas. The key message here is, is the idea and the objective of the full utilisation of the North Sea reserves. This is described in the strategy as the foundation of our energy security, certainly something on which a great deal of, of weight is placed. Uh, we've got a series of different initiatives to support that. Uh, I've listed those there. I pull out uh, one in particular, the gas and oil new project regulatory accelerator. Um, it doesn't trip off the tongue, but it's certainly important because of the focus on increasing rapid development of schemes. And that goes back to that second theme, the, the idea of speeding up the delivery of infrastructure in this area. The oil and gas sector, though, needs to be uh, viewed in, in context. It is perhaps at the heart of um, that tension, that first theme that I described. But the strategy tackles this head on, and I've, I've quoted in the final bullet point uh, what it suggests, that there's no contradiction, it suggests, between our commitment to net zero and our commitment to a strong and evolving North Sea industry. I think it's fair to say that that is, uh, to some extent, controversial. There's certainly one view to suggest that that, that balance is uh, and can be struck, given the, um, the, the what, what we expect to see by way of a significant decline in those reserves, even with this um, increased or potentially increased uh, utilisation. But at the same time, that's not certain, uh, and whether that balance is, will be struck uh, remains to be seen. The next big sector to talk about is wind, uh, offshore and indeed onshore. So starting with offshore wind, which is probably the, the place where the strategy uh, gives uh, wind the greatest focus, there is a clear objective to increase the pace of deployment, uh, the target of by 25%, and that's in a, a period up to 2030, uh, and including new and more innovative types of offshore wind, for example, floating wind. Uh, again, that second theme of reducing consent in time, that comes through very strongly. And we have another task force, this time the Offshore Wind Acceleration Task Force, which is to be tasked with uh, that objective. We get a specific mention of the Renewables NPS here, uh, dealing in particular with energy security and net zero. So again, a clear idea that the planning system needs to speed up and provide more support for this type of development, although what that support is going to look like, we don't yet know. 
uh, and linked to that a number of environmental packages, uh, what's described as strategic compensation environmental measures, linked to the review of habitats regulation assessment, that the strategy boldly proclaims that it wants to reduce the reams of paperwork when one has undertaken HRA, um, and, and again, a clear objective, but whether or not that's going to be realistic is, is something altogether different. Turning to onshore wind, the focus here, well, firstly, dealing with Scotland and Wales, very lukewarm, um, little more than a commitment to work with the devolved government on those matters. As to England, there's a slightly greater focus, a suggestion of, of prioritising uh, local communities, putting local communities in control is how the strategy describes it. But essentially, the approach is one of very little by way of change, certainly no wholesale change, perhaps greater consultation uh, and some support for the repowering of existing onshore wind. So little change, I think, there from the position as it exists today under the NPPF. Turning to nuclear, this is certainly an area of much more ambitious growth, essentially a, a target of tripling existing capacity by 2050. Uh, uh, and indeed, it, to that end, the suggestion is that nuclear will make up to 25% of projected electricity demand um, when fully on stream. So what's the focus? Well, three uh, key aspects to, to pull out. Firstly, the future nuclear enabling fund. And as I've said there, that's essentially a repackaged announcement. But two, two new announcements. Firstly, the Great British Nuclear Vehicle. Again, a, a task force and accelerator looking to bring nuclear projects through to fruition and certainly to try and achieve that much more quickly than nuclear projects have progressed previously. Uh, and also, thirdly, potential avenues for government funding, although again, at high level, uh, fairly lukewarm, uh, lot, lots to wait and see on in, in that respect. Uh, but also in terms of planning and spatial planning, a clear desire to develop a nuclear siting strategy for the long term, probably in addition to uh, the current eight designated nuclear sites that we have. Uh, wrapping up a few other points, solar and other technologies. So in terms of solar, the focus is really on ground mounted solar, uh, particular focus on strengthening policy in favour of the development of what's described as non-protected land, although what that uh, means is, is yet to be seen, one assumed outside ONB, outside Greenbelt, uh, and to that end the uh, the strategy discusses, uh, for example, effective use of PDL, the co-location of solar and employment uses, uh, and also greater community participation in solar schemes. Certainly recently, um, solar schemes have become uh, quite a bit more controversial uh, amongst local communities. Uh, other technologies and other linked aspects, well, network storage and flexibility gives, is given particular focus, the idea of accelerating the connection between network infrastructure, uh, and really trying to ensure that there is uh, greater cohesion. Uh, and then finally, hydrogen, in particular, a focus on green hydrogen, and the idea that this can be valuable because of its flexibility and because of its use as a storage solution. And again, an ambitious target in the time period up to 2030 on that score. Uh, and with that uh, introduction, I'll have to pick up on some of those themes that are, are, I've talked through there. Thanks, uh, Matthew. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to pick up uh, on the question of how uh, these schemes can be consented, both under the 1990 Act and, the, and, and under the 2008 Act. Um, these are, the, broadly speaking, the topics that uh, I'm going to try and cover in the next 20 minutes or so, necessarily with a bit of a light touch. But first of all, the role of each route to consent, uh, the key opportunities and pitfalls along each of those routes as I see them. Uh, and then a bit more on the current policy matrix uh, carrying on from Matthew's presentation. Uh, and then looking at both the risk of legal challenges under the particular consenting routes and future reform. So starting off with the consenting routes, um, I think it's probably most people who are on the uh, webinar will be well aware of this, but it's perhaps just worth reflecting for a moment on uh, how the energy consenting regime is arranged. Uh, the thresholds in the Planning Act 2008 determine what a nationally significant infrastructure project is and what is not a nationally significant infrastructure project. And that's all in 
section 14, but you need to understand the subsequent sections to make sense of it. And the energy NSIPs are further defined in sections 15 through to 21. And 15 is the generating station provision, 16 electric lines. And then the subsequent provisions are concerned with gas storage, LNG facilities, uh, gas uh, pipelines, and uh, other uh, pipes. So um, just focusing on section 15 for a moment, I think the key point to note uh, is the absence of onshore wind uh, in section 15 is expressly excluded from it. Um, and the other point to note is that so far as the thresholds are concerned, the, the key threshold is uh, in the section 15 generating station, NSIP definition is 50 megawatts for uh, onshore facilities and 100 megawatts offshore. Um, section 33 then means that where an NSIP threshold is met, consent under other regimes is neither required nor can it be given. So the NSIP regime takes priority. It's worth also reflecting here on section 35 directions, which can be given in the field of energy. And these are directions which allow a particular development or a particular class of development to be identified as uh, being a nationally significant, significant infrastructure project. Um, and that's particularly important in, in recent experience for interconnector schemes, um, which have been the subject of section 35 directions. And then below those thresholds, the 1990 Act becomes the primary route to consent outside those thresholds in the onshore environment. There's a residual role for the Electricity Act 1989 in respect of uh, offshore development below the thresholds. Uh, and also it's worth noting section 34 of the 2008 Act, which uh, makes provision for Welsh offshore generating stations and the ability to consent those under the Transport and Works Act. But for the present purposes, I'm gonna focus on the two main schemes, the Planning Act and the 1990 Act. So Planning Act 2008, I've already mentioned the key threshold for generating sta uh, stations. Uh, obviously, the attractiveness of the 2008 Act is the single consenting route, including the acquisition of land and rights, as well as the consent that's required for the development concerned. And I think probably the key question for developers is, does that combined approach create an opportunity or does it create potential pitfalls? Because necessarily uh, development consent orders, which involve, for example, substantial acquisition of land and rights, involve more complexity than simply applying for a planning permission. Uh, that said, obviously, it means that um, the higher uh, above the threshold, more, more development can be consented. Uh, also, that it's unnecessary to seek other orders, a single route to consent can be taken. The complexity of the pre-application process obviously is well known. Uh, and I think probably, um, at least for a period under this regime, the complexity of the pre-application process was seen as a price to be paid for the relative certainty that would follow in terms of both the length of the subsequent decision-making process and its outcome, because of course, the vast majority of consents were granted and we had very few legal challenges and even fewer successful legal challenges in the first um, almost decade of the, 90, of the 2008 Act scheme. Um, but then I think more recently, obviously we've seen a rise in delays to examination processes. Um, COVID didn't help with that in terms of delaying examinations, but more generally, there have been a number of extensions of examinations and the decision making stage, the Secretary of State stage under the 2008 Act has been uh, slow in recent years. And there's been a rise of refusals and uh, there's also been a rise of legal challenges. So in terms of refusals, um, interconnector scheme, the Aquind interconnector, uh, was refused, um, recent, relatively recent refusal of an offshore wind farm in the Thanis extension, and then successful legal challenges to a number of development consent orders, which I'll mention a bit more 
later, including uh, the Pierce case, which concerned the Vanguard, Vanguard uh, offshore wind farm. So um, I think a slightly changing picture in, in terms of views of prospects uh, and certainty in the, in the Planning Act process. Um, I just wanted to touch on what I think some of the key issues have been in recent years in, in the consenting process, and this overlaps to some extent with the legal challenges that have arisen. Um, the, the first issue that's probably worth mentioning is the question of alternatives. Um, and perhaps one of the best illustrations of this is in the Stonehenge case, the A303 case, which obviously isn't concerning energy infrastructure. But there, in that case, um, the National Network's national policy statement contained a uh, effectively a policy limitation on the scope to which or the extent to which the decision maker had to inquire as to the consideration of alternatives. And the point that uh, was found to um, undo the Stonehenge scheme uh, was that the consideration that had been given was limited to the NPS scope of considering alternatives. And uh, the point accepted by the High Court in that case was that there may be a freestanding duty to consider alternatives where particular planning harm arises. In that case, fair to say a wholly exceptional case as it was described, uh, a finding of harm to a World Heritage Site. Um, so the scope to consider alternatives is broadened in that case and I think in the Aquind refusal, we see that uh, sort of thinking playing out in the Secretary of State's decision. Um, obviously, there are some politics involved in the Aquind decision, but um, the refusal is ultimately on a question of the consideration of alternatives. In that case, the consideration of alternative location for the uh, grid connection for the converter station uh, facilities um, in um, Hampshire. And um, there, uh, the Secretary of State found inadequate consideration of alternative option for uh, for the general for the connecting um, facilities. So that's alternatives. I think is a key issue. I think then the other point worth flagging is cumulative effects. Uh, Pierce as the best example of that, and um, really probably reflecting to some extent the crowded space. Um, uh, particularly for um, offshore wind farms and their grid connections uh, on the east coast of England. Um, Pierce concerned the interaction of the Vanguard scheme and the Boreas scheme, uh, two DCOs that were connecting at uh, the same grid connection location, uh, and the failure of the Secretary of State in that case to properly consider the cumulative effects of both grid connections in the same location in granting development consent for Vanguard. Um, that's now, of course, been revisited, uh, both uh, wind farms consented, uh, but it shows the importance of, of consideration of cumulative effects in those cases. And then the final key issue that I identified, again, it particularly, uh, although not exclusively, but particularly in the offshore wind area, and that's habitats. And um, Matthew's already identified that the government is proposing to look in more detail at strategic compensation, uh, but certainly we're seeing increasingly uh, a need to consider derogation, to consider eropi um, uh, for particular impacts on, um, on seabirds, for instance, um, and um, reflecting really the, the extent of development in the North Sea uh, and the extent uh, of designated sites that are potentially affected by uh, large scale offshore wind. Uh, so that's an area where there's ongoing consideration. Clearly, the industry is moving through phases of um, finding a new way of dealing with matters. Um, post Hornsey 3, looking towards uh, compensation where necessary. Uh, and clearly, there's, there's going to be some more work done by the government on that. So then just turning back to the 1990 Act, the more perhaps familiar territory for some people, um, I suppose in terms of the opportunities of the 1990 Act, there remains um, an opportunity of speed because the 2008 Act process does take some time. And certainly when you factor in the appeal process in the 1990 Act, that used to be a similar concern about delay. 
but we're now in a world where the planning inspectorate is working far quicker to deal with planning appeals. So even in a, a case, an inquiry case for uh, significant energy generation, um, we'd now expect to have an inquiry within uh, four months or so of an appeal being lodged, whereas previously these sorts of schemes were taking 12 months, maybe more, to get to uh, an inquiry. Um, local determinations, I've, I've put there, is it a vice or is it a virtue? Well, as, as you know, it depends on the politics, it depends on the scheme. Um, I think the observation that has been made in the sector is that there is at least in places, well, perhaps generally, there is support for renewables, and at least in uh, places, there is specific support for renewable energy development uh, in the backyard of the local residents. The next point really is to think about is the role of the development plan. Uh, lots of local plans are uh, silent or say very little about energy development. Um, and given the section 38.6 priority to the development plan, uh, that can cause some issues and of course those issues I think will only become heightened when we look towards the levelling up and regeneration bill which proposes to uh, increase the weight that is going to be given to the presumption in favour of the development plan. Um, so uh, just an example there of, of the um, uh, opposition to uh, solar being consented uh, I think in that instance um, uh, under the 1990 Act. And it's worth noting here that there have been a number of recent appeal decisions for refusals under the 1990 Act for solar. Um, they're not heading in one particular direction is my observation. Um, I think most recently last week I saw an appeal in, in Norfolk where um, the inspector uh, refused the appeal against a, a refusal for a solar park, solar farm, um, on the grounds of impact on agricultural land, uh, which I'll mention a bit more in just one moment. So um, briefly then, something more on the current policy matrix and just taking forward Matthew's observations. Obviously, the, the current position under the 2008 Act is the uh, national policy statements as they stand from 2011. They are um, out of date. Uh, in places they read as being a bit rusty, but we also have the emerging uh, national policy statement suite and recent decisions from the Secretary of State indicate that he intends to give that material, that suite material weight in the decision making process ahead of its designation, which I assume is now imminent. Um, so that's the, the framework overall, but there's also the MPPF, um, which uh, Matthew's considered, um, particularly important for decisions under the 1990 Act, and particularly if local plans are silent or at least quiet on energy development. I think one of the key issues, um, particularly at, um, in, under the 1990 Act, is the clarity of policy on climate change and how that is to be dealt with. And um, Jenny will say a bit more about this in a moment. Um, but uh, I think really the question is, is there a clear policy uh, at the moment um, in terms of um, the support for uh, renewable energy development? I think certainly in recent decision letters of the Secretary of State, we see that clearer policy, which is perhaps being reflected in the emerging NPSs. We see that already in decision letters uh, where the Secretary of State is now uh, tending to note that the identified need for a significant increase in renewable energy, um, which was set out in the 2011 uh, National Policy Statement Suite, um, is um, even greater now than it was 2011. There's recognition of that in a number of decision letters. On solar, uh, obviously it's an area which is getting a lot of interest. I think obviously there are some particular issues around agricultural land. Um, the policy history there is slightly convoluted in the sense that the uh, MPPF was accompanied by a written ministerial statement in, in its 2015 amendment, uh, noting the particular impacts on agricultural land and effectively trying to create a presumption against um, use of uh, solar on um, best and most versatile. As I've noted, that's, um, all, that's still uh, leading to the undoing of some solar proposals. 
and clearly it's a matter of importance for the Secretary of State as well in NSIP schemes in light of the terms of his own policy. Um, uh, but uh, as I said, those decisions uh, are sort of going both ways at the moment. And then the final uh, sort of big question on the policy matrix, and Matthew's touch on it, is onshore wind. Um, we're currently in a position where the uh, regime for consenting uh, onshore wind is the 1990 Act. The criteria in national policy remain very strict, very confined. Um, there, there is, of course, much conversation about whether that can or should be liberalised. Uh, but at the moment, it is certainly in England not a positive story for onshore wind proposals, but maybe more to come on that. So briefly then, uh, legal challenges. Um, I've mentioned a few cases already. I think legal challenges are a key risk um, uh, under both consenting routes. Um, the first point to note, I think, is in respect of uh, proposals for hydrocarbon based uh, uh, energy development. Clearly, and as um, Jenny's um, presentation will illustrate shortly, clearly there's a lot of interest uh, in trying to stop new hydrocarbon based development um, uh, through legal challenge. And uh, there are challenges uh, to uh, many, if not most, uh, uh, schemes which are permitting new or expanded uh, exploitation of hydrocarbons in the energy sector. That's uh, including in respect of uh, the broader strategies in the North Sea, uh, but also in terms of individual decision making on particular projects. I think just a, a couple of flags beyond the points that Jenny will, will come on to um, in terms of other points that are being raised. Uh, clearly, in the renewable sector, the enthusiasm to challenge new renewables is not so great. But nonetheless, there are particular issues uh, around, um, as I, I've said, consideration of alternatives, around cumulative impacts, and particularly in that busy area in the east of England, where there's a huge amount of new energy infrastructure being proposed as a result of the North Sea resource. Um, uh, the key issues and recent challenges I, I've, I've broadly dealt with. Uh, as I've said, I think alternatives are a particular area of interest, both in the courts and in the minds of decision makers, uh, along with compliance with the uh, EIA and habitats um, requirements. Uh, and obviously those uh, may themselves be the subject of future reform. So um, finally, uh, looking towards the future program, for reform. Um, we've mentioned several times already the energy NPS suite and obviously that's expected uh, soon. But I think there's a broader picture here in respect of uh, what's being done by the government and what we can expect in policy terms. First of all, there's, there's clearly um, uh, an issue about uh, grid connections and the extent of um, grid infrastructure that's required to uh, make sure that this new energy infrastructure uh, is uh, connected and connected in the right place. So there's the offshore transmission network review, along with further work going on about um, improving grid connections uh, across, across the nation. I think it's also worth uh, mentioning again onshore wind, um, that there clearly needs to be some more work done on that at the moment. Uh, as I say, the policy environment is not positive, but um, there's, there clearly is going to be a future role for onshore wind in some form, uh, and further consideration will need to be given to that. I, I think the other points to note are perhaps the broader aspects of the planning reform programme. So um, the MPPF is being revisited this week. I'm not sure uh, the extent to which any new proposals in that will touch on uh, energy, but um, clearly reforms to the development plan system through the levelling up and regeneration bill ha have the prospect of impacting on the consenting of energy infrastructure. There's also a sort of question about the extent to which uh, the government is going to take a more uh, proactive approach for consenting energy infrastructure, given the um, given the, the acute pressures that are being felt, both, both from meeting climate change targets, which are uh, at risk, uh, and from the immediate energy crises in terms of uh, both the, the war in Ukraine and prices. Um, I think 
uh, in terms of um, particular steps being taken, there is a, a pressure to try and speed up determination uh, of um, applications for de development consent. Whether that's going to work, I don't know. Um, uh, obviously, those timetables are already under pressure as things stand. The tendency, as, as I've already noted, is to seek extensions of time rather than to make determinations earlier than they might otherwise be. So it's hard to see how much time can be saved in those processes. So that those are the sort of directions of future reform, looking at speeding up the consenting of the infrastructure. I think the final thing to mention, of course, is, is the diversification beyond what is now uh, fairly established um, energy sources. Um, we've got the um, now established market for offshore wind and the processes for doing that, but uh, there's a new range of development coming in, floating wind, uh, and also uh, looking towards a, a hydrogen-based uh, future and uh, the extent to which infrastructure is going to start coming forward for that. So a lot to do in the energy sphere. And in the meantime, a lot of work in terms of making sure that the consenting system works um, swiftly and efficiently to consent the right infrastructure in the right places. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Jenny to deal with climate change issues. Thanks very much, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, I'm going to be dealing with energy development and climate change. Just check my mouse works. There we go. Uh, yeah. And so I'm going to consider two aspects. Uh, firstly, um, the climate change parts of the National Policy Statements Review, which have already been touched on by both Matthew and Richard, um, but where, where you know, the direction of travel with that and whether it's whether those uh, draft new policy statements um, are, are achieving their ends, their stated ends. And then I'm going to do a roundup of recent cases over the last year or two relating to energy and climate change and picking, on, picking up on a couple of the points of challenge that Richard uh, mentioned. So if I just start then with um, the national policy statements, um, those uh, draft statements um the consultation in relation to those started in september last year and um some consider that that was perhaps prompted by a judicial review claim um, which was brought um, in 2020 against what was said to be an unlawful failure by the secretary of state to review the energy policy statements which of course were designated in 2011 so some time ago now um, uh, against the unlawful failure to, to do that in light of changes to the climate change policy and of course the, um, the net zero target which came in in, in, in 2019. Um, that judicial review was settled prior to a hearing um, on the basis of an announcement by the Secretary of State that it would be, um, the government would be consulting on the revised energy national policy statements precisely um, to uh, to deal with the net 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 zero um, target and other aspects of climate change policy, and the government, in fact, denied that the JR had any had anything to do with that review, um, as they were intending to do it anyway. But perhaps it was slightly expedited, at least, by that um, threatened judicial review. <clears throat> uh, so the consultation, as I said, um, commenced in September last year. It closed on the 29th of November. And then there was a also a scrutiny by the um, Select Committee. Um, so the House of Commons Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee took evidence in relation to the draft uh, national policy statements. Um, and it's EN 1 to 5, the nuclear one, number 6, was not actually part of this um, review. Um, now, the key issue identified by the review um, of the House of Commons Committee was a concern that the overarching e e -E -E EN1 um, did not pri provide the step change necessary to deliver the required scale of new national nationally significant infrastructure projects at a sufficiently rapid pace to deliver the government's net zero aims. That was identified as a key concern. And it was considered to be largely due to the ambiguity in the drafting about the relative weight of climate change um, to local impacts to be taken into account in making planning decisions. So um, 
it was considered that there wasn't really enough there to say that this urgent need for new uh, clean energy infrastructure um, should take precedence over perhaps more local impacts, local planning impacts. Um, and the committee put forward a series of recommendations to address this. Um, so the first one was that they should be, that the overarching energy uh, policy statement should be further amended to make the government's commit commitment to net zero more explicit and front and center and to provide a clear and unambiguous direction to the Secretary of State to prioritize the importance of climate change in decision-making. Um, and this was sh should make clear a direction, um, uh, sorry, a, a presumption in favor of the presumption of delivering new energy infrastructure required to, to deliver net zero. Um, and it was recommended that the uh, policy statement should explicitly set out that the MPSs take precedent over any conflicting local or statutory bodies planning policies. Uh, and it was also recommended that the government should work with local and statutory bodies to ensure that their policy policies are consistent with delivering net zero and with enabling the infrastructure necess necessary to do that. Uh, the committee also recommended that the link between the government's renewables targets and planning principles should be explicit. Um, it also wanted the targets actually in the policy statements, although the government said those already exist elsewhere. Nevertheless, the committee uh, recommended that there should be a very clear link uh, in respect of each techn technology or generation capacity so that the planning authorities and industry clearly understand that and that, again that there's a clear direction to delivery of new uh, rene renewable energy infrastructure projects. Um, there was also some dismay about the fact that it's taken more than 10 years to re review the national policy statements so far and there was a clear recommendation that in light of the rapid pace of technological change and of course the changes in um, the net zero ambitions that those policy statements should be reviewed every five years and uh, lastly um, there was uh, recommendations about more explicit explicit recognition of the role of onshore wind carbon capture and hydrogen in achieving net zero and our continuing theme throughout our presentation today, in relation to onshore wind, the recommendation was that the government should consider including that um, within the NSIP regime. Although it appears from the recent um, policy document, the strategy that Matt discussed, that that's it's clearly the, the case that the government doesn't, doesn't appear to anyway, have an intention of, of doing that, <clears throat> at least at this stage. So that's um, the uh, energy, uh, sorry, the planning policy statements. Um, that uh, recommendations by the committee were published in February and we're still awaiting um, what the government will do in relation to any changes to those drafts, if any, or whether it will just go ahead and adopt them as, as written. I'll now move on to the second part of my um, presentation. And this is just to run through a few um, recent cases over the last couple of years to give you a flavour of what types of um, challenges are being brought with the climate change theme. And there does seem to be a very clear increase in the number of climate change related challenges. I'll just run through those and give you a few observations of mine at the end as to the direction of travel overall. So the first, perhaps before I get into the, 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 the um, cases themselves, it's just worth having in mind the sort of uh, legislative framework, uh, which is often drawn upon by claimants in relation to uh, climate related challenges. And of course, front and centre is the Climate Change Act itself and um, section one, the, uh, the, the target, the net zero target, uh, which um, is required to be achieved by 2050 since 2019. And the um, section four duty to set carbon budgets to meet um, in an incremental way over the, over the years, towards uh, 2050 um, meet incremental targets so that, that that budget, that overall target is eventually received, uh, sorry, achieved. Uh, and then there's also duties um, under section 13 and 14 to prepare policies and proposals to seek to meet those budgets and to publish those policies and proposals um, and, uh, and report to parliament about them. And some of those sections will, will be touched upon when I go through some of the cases. Um, we also are obviously aware of the um, Carbon Budget Order um, 2021, which has set the um, uh, 
on the way target to 2035, which is seeking a 78% reduction by reference to 1990, on the way, of course, to, to achieving the 100% reduction in, in 2050. And then there's policy updates, which are also drawn on in litigation. I set those out at the bottom of the slide, and I won't go through those in detail. We've already touched on some of those uh, in the previous presentations. So just running through then a few of the cases, um, I've listed them on these slides as the Client Earth um, challenge about gas-fired generating units. Then I've, I'm gonna discuss the emissions trading scheme that's replaced the uh, EU trading scheme. And then I'll go on to talk about the EIA and whether that should be considering um, end use of energy. Um, I'll then touch on an, a related case in Scotland, that's the Greenpeace and Advocate General. And then a few other cases uh, relating to um, oil and gas. Um, and then um, a uh, final case about airport expansion, so not an energy case, but um, which has uh, uh, principles that are of, of, of um, have implications for energy development also. So I'll start then with the Client Earth um, case from 2021. This was a challenge to a DCO um, to grant permission for two gas fire gener generating units at an existing power station. Um, and the challenge was that the uh, overarching national policy statement for energy required a quantitative assessment of need for those gas fired energy and en uh, generating units. And again, this is, this is one of the types of cases which is becoming much more prevalent, um, namely uh, pretty much all uh, carbon related energy schemes are challenged now. They do seem to be challenged um, by reference to climate change principles and by reference to the net zero target. Um, this one was framed by reference to the policy statement, which the claimant suggested or argued a required a quantitative assessment of need at the application stage. That challenge was rejected. The High Court held that that was not the, the correct interpretation of the policy statement. There was no requirement for a quantitative assessment of need at application stage. And also the court made clear that the weight to give to greenhouse gas emissions impact is a matter for the decision maker and the Secretary of State was entitled to um, regard it as not being determinative in the balancing exercise. So as long as the Secretary of State took it into account, which he did, um, it was up to him how much weight he accorded to it and it, it did not need to be determinative. Usual standard judicial review principles there, um, court not intervening in the um, planning judgment effectively of the decision maker. Second case I wanted to briefly mention, uh, not a planning case, but this was um, the a challenge to the UK emissions trading scheme, which replaced the um, EU version of the scheme after Brexit. Um, the challenge was made on the basis that it uh, was argued that it, the, the trading scheme failed to meet section 44 of the Climate Change Act in that it failed to achieve a reduction in activities causing greenhouse gas emissions. And it was argued that the Secretary of State failed to take into account the Paris Agreement and of course the um, urgent need uh, expressed there to reduce um, carbon emissions. Again, this challenge was rejected. Um, the court held that the Secretary of State didn't unlawfully fail to take into account the Paris Agreement. Whilst it wasn't expressly mentioned, it was clear that the Secretary of State had its um, objectives firmly in mind. Um, as to the statutory um, duty under Section 44 for emissions trading schemes to limit or encourage the limitation of activities, the court held, was, the court held that that was all they had to do i.e. You know, limit, they didn't have to achieve a reduction in activities causing, causing greenhouse emissions. They just had to re result in the limitation of those activities, not a necessary reduction of those activities. So again, another challenge failed. Um, next case, um, one I'm sure you're quite a lot of you are already familiar with. This is the um, litigation relating to the planning permission for extraction of oil at Horse Hill in Surrey. Um, a commercial extra extraction of oil. 
And the main issue in the case was should the environmental assessment process have included an assessment of the downstream effects of the refinement, distribution and sale of the oil in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions of the use and the commercial use of that oil. Um, at High Court, the uh, Mr Justice Holgate um, dismissed the application for judicial review, um, finding that um, as a matter of law, the greenhouse gas emissions from the future combustion of the end product of the development, i.e. of the oil, oil products, was incapable of falling within the scope of the EIA regulations. He held that the true legal test of whether an effect constitutes an indirect likely significant effect requiring assessment was whether uh, the effect on the environment is an effect of the development for which planning permission is sought. And he held that it was not because um, a further development would be necessary, a further project would be necessary um, to, uh, for the, for the um, refinery uh, of the oil um, and, its, and its end use. Claimant appealed against that decision of Mr Justice Holgate and ultimately the appeal failed in the Court of Appeal. But um, unusually in, um, in, in present times, at least in my experience, it was a split decision. And I'll come on to that now. So um, Mr. Just sorry, Lord Justice Limblom in the Court of Appeal identified a number of relevant principles, some of which will be very familiar. Um, first was that whilst a broad and purposive approach to the interpretation of EU leg legislation is appropriate, it's still always necessary to respect the words actually used. Um, and the legislation for EIA is directed at the project of the development. Um, and that concept is one to which a broad interpretation should be applied. Um, an assessment of the likely significant effects of the project on the environment does extend to the effects of the use of the works as well as their construction. And there's some very clear EU case law that makes that clear. And, um, uh, but the EIA must address the particular development under cons consideration, not some further or different project. And the uh, nature of indirect secondary or cumulative effects, all of which are mentioned in the regulations and in the directive, um, as requiring assessment. What those will be depends on the nature and particular facts and circumstances of the development under consideration. Um, and whilst there should be sufficient assessment of those effects, establishing what those are, what information should be included, and whether that information is, in, is adequate or inadequate is for the relevant planning authority of course, subject always to the court's jurisdiction on conventional public law grounds, i.e. Wensbury irrationality. So um, a classic sort of non-interventionist approach here that it's for the, um, the decision maker again, not the court to um, consider what are those effects. Although of course, as we know, just from the previous slide in, um, in the high court, Mr. Justice Holgate considered it was for the court to decide that the, um, the, the use or end use of the products of the development, i.e. the end use of the oil and gas or the oil in this case, um, could be as a matter of law excluded from EIA assessment. The Court of Appeal um, disagreed with Mr. Justice Holgate on that and, um, uh, and uh, rejected the idea that there was a true legal test as to what is the effect of the developments. Um, Instead, instead um, consideration needs to be given to the degree of connection between the development and its putative effects. That consideration is for the planning authority. Um, and Mr Justice Holgate was wrong to hold that the um, greenhouse gas emissions from future combustion were as a matter of law incapable of falling within the scope of the EIA. They may be in a particular case capable of falling within the scope, they may they, or, or they may not, but that's for the evaluation of the planning authority. Um, and the downstream emissions uh, might possibly be regarded as indirect environmental effects, depending on the specifics of the project. So um, the Court of Appeal concluded, as I said, of the majority of two to one, Mr. Uh, Lord Justice Limblom and Lord Justice Lewison, that the council's decision to exclude downstream greenhouse gas emissions was a rational decision and so was lawful. Although Lord Justice Mollian dissented um, not surprisingly, given it was a split decision and given that this involves climate change, 
um, there is an application for permission to appeal to the Supreme Court and that uh, is that the, the decision on that is pending. So we'll have to wait and see what happens in relation to that. Um, related case, this is a case in Scotland, um, Greenpeace against Advocate General, very similar case in terms of principles at least to the Finch case. This was a Scottish judicial review of an oil and gas authority consent for offshore oil and gas exploitation project in the North Sea. Um, the claimant alleged that regulation 3A of the um, assessment environmental effects regulations required an assessment of greenhouse gas emissions of the use of extracted and refined oil and gas by the end consumer. Um, that was uh, claim was rejected and the Scottish court relied on the High Court decision in Finch um, uh, because this, this was decided between the High Court and the Court of Appeal decisions in Finch. Um, and of course, there was a clear legal decision from Mr. Justice Holgate at that stage that the consumption of the extracted refined oil and gas by the end user was not a direct or indirect significant effect of the project, so no requirement to assess. Um, so it's interesting to see that the Finch case has already been applied um, in, in other cases. Um, this is uh, Cox then is the next one. Um, again, not a planning decision, but an interesting um, indication of um, the appetite for campaigners to challenge um, a, a number of varied decisions um, <clears throat> in relation to their effects on the climate change uh, agenda and on the net zero target. This was a judicial review to changes made by the Oil and Gas Authority to the a uh, strategy called Maximising Recovery Strategy for the UK. And the claimant argued that the changes made to that strategy were irrational in light of the Secretary of State's duties under the Climate Change Act 2008. That challenge, similar theme, was rejected. Um, the court held that amending the strategy in, in the way that it was amended did not necessarily result in maximised extraction of oil and gas. Instead, it required maximization of the expected net value of economically recoverable petroleum. Um, not, so not necessarily the most extraction, just making make sure its um, value is maximized. Splitting hairs there, not sure really, potentially, but the court also um, held that the claimant had not sufficiently appreciated that the carbon costs had been brought within the assessment of economic recovery, so had been taken into account and embedded in the strategy. And again, similar theme, the balancing of the various objections and the sorry, various objectives that should be, so climate change and economic recovery, um, were a matter for the regulator and not the court. So again, a non-interventionist approach by the court in that case. Uh, a, a very recent case, or at least I think this was in May last year, um, <clears throat> and this was a judicial review um, by Friends of the Earth of a decision of the UK uh, government related body to provide um, 1.15 billion US dollars in export finance to support um, a liquefied natural gas project in Mozambique. It was alleged that the decision was based on an error of law or fact, um, namely that the project and its funding was compatible with the UK's commitments under the Paris Climate Change Agreement and or assisted Mozambique to achieve its commitments under the Paris Agreement. So um, as you can gather from that, the uh, decision um, considered that, that, that those consistencies were made out and the claim was on the basis that as a matter of fact and law, they were not either because um, the information didn't support that contention um, or um, the contention did not properly understand what the UK commitments were in relation to that. Um, the claimant also argued that the decision was otherwise unlawful insofar it was re reached without regard to essential relevant con considerations uh, in, re in, in reaching the view that the funding was aligned with those obligations. So again, the, an, another public law uh, um, principle that uh, relevant considerations were left out of account. Um, along with the uh, general trend in these types of cases, again, uh, that challenge failed on a detailed consideration of all the facts um, and uh, various government uh, internal communications in relation to uh, the 
uh, <clears throat> proposal to put forward that finance. And then lastly, um, again, this, as, as I said earlier, this is not actually an energy case, um, but it is a uh, related, um, has, has related principles that are applicable to energy types development. Um, it was a judicial review challenge of an airport expansion project, Southampton International Airport. Um, and the challenge was brought on the basis that the EIA failed to ensure that the cumulative project greenhouse gas emissions were considered and were acceptable in line with carbon budgeting under the Climate Change Act. Claim was rejected. Um, it was found that the other airports expansion plans which had been referenced, so I think there were Bradford, Bristol, um, uh, and one other, um, the court held that those had been taken into account in the national figures, which were taken into account under the EIA assessment um, process. And the court also held that there was nothing unlawful in assessing the project emissions as a percentage of the national budget, and then taking a broad judgment as to the acceptability of that percentage. There was no clear, hard and fast limit as to the contribution to the national bud budget that a project would make. Um, there was no clear requirement um, uh, as to what was acceptable or what was not acceptable. This was all part of the broad judgment, again, of the decision maker, and the court would not interfere um, with, with, with that judgment and would not um, seek to suggest that there was any particular um, uh, uh, threshold beyond which a um, uh, it, it, <coughs> level of emissions would, would upset the carbon budgeting regime. So we can see from these cases um, a, a very clear trend that at least in the last year or two and in the UK courts, there has been a reluctance to allow um, climate change related challenges. Um, there has not been a particular appetite for the courts to intervene in the decision-making process. And that's of course, in accordance with ordinary public law principles, but there's certainly no um, indication at the moment of a, uh, of a court intervening in the way it did for example, in the air quality line of cases, the client earth air quality line of cases, where you'll recall um, Mr. Justice Garnet, I think uh, Garnet um, did intervene and did, did accept the client earth's um, challenge to the inadequacy of the um, air quality strategies that the government was producing. And, and, and there were very clear requirements placed on the Secretary of State to remedy um, deficiencies in those air quality strategies. And we haven't seen that sort of interventionist approach as yet by the courts in relation to climate change. Um, but there's worth just noting there is a um, outstanding judicial review to watch, um, which might be perhaps more along the lines of, the, of that um, air quality type challenge. And that is the very recent um, judicial review of the government's net zero strategy, which was produced in October 2021. And that's the one that which contains the policies and proposals regarding to and relating to, amongst other things, energy development with a view to meeting the net zero target. And the claim is that the that, that strategy contains insufficient information and insufficient quantification to demonstrate that the carbon budgets would be met and that that's contrary to sections 13 and 14 of the 2008 Act. Um, in court, there was a revelation that the that an internal email showed that government knew that policies and proposals in the strategy would not meet the targets, but that this was not clear on the face of the net zero strategy and had not been made clear to Parliament. And that formed one of the basis of the challenge that there was Parliament was effectively misled, um, was what the claimants were seeking to um, suggest, were, were misled as to what was intended to be achieved by that strategy and as to its compliance with section 13. There was a hearing last week um, before Mr. Justice Holgate and judgment is awaited. So it's definitely worth watching the outcome of that litigation. And that's um, the end of my talk. So thanks very much. And we'll, we should now have a little bit of time to answer your questions. Thanks very much, everybody.
Um, we've had a few a few questions, some of which I've endeavoured to answer in the the Q and A as as we've gone. But there are, I think, a, a few points that are are outstanding, and we might elaborate on. Um, the the interaction uh, between climate change and petroleum policy uh, as an issue as it arose in the Cox case. I think, Richard, are you able to help us on on that in a bit more a bit more a bit more depth? Yeah, um, um, is Jenny mentioned uh, the Cox litigation, which was quite an interesting case. Um, I acted for the Secretary of State, and, and the one of the issues there was really about. The relationship between tax policy and um, the uh, approach to uh, the support for petroleum extraction in the North Sea. Uh, obviously that factual matrix has changed quite a lot because of the um, latest approach to windfall taxing of um, hydrocarbon extraction. So it, it's in, in a sense that it's moved on. But um, it's a good I think it's a good example of um, perhaps the difficulties that um, there are in these areas where there's obviously the strong legislative regime in in favour of um, protecting uh, or, or dealing with climate change. Uh, we've got binding targets. We've got um, you know extensive policy and statutory basis for um, dealing with climate change matters. But at the same time, the reality is that we have a continued need for and extraction of hydrocarbons um, and the combustion of hydrocarbons in the in the UK's energy system and that's not going to go away for um, several years so I think in terms of policy challenges it's it's interesting to see a case like Cox is really a, a, a sort of um, collateral attack on the on the tax regime and its support for um, for hydrocarbon extraction um, it, for, from a climate change angle and I think we may see sort of similar challenges as, as the government has to look towards maximising uh, North Sea extraction over, over the next um, decade or so, particularly given the energy crisis in, in Eastern Europe. Thanks. Um, we've got another question in the Q&A about repowering. Would the presumption in favour of repowering apply if original planning permission granted um, in over-reliance upon community inducements? It's now contrary to the principles of right and seven day. Um, any of you who do want to tackle that one? Well, I talked about repowering a little bit in my presentation. I think right's one of Jenny's cases, but um, let, let me have a stab at the question anyway. Uh, I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't benefit from the policy presumption in, in Power 158 of the MPPF in that circumstance. Uh, you might have to think about the consequence of right in terms of your plan and balance and when you're striking that again if you're putting a new application. But certainly for the purposes of that 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 policy you support, I think you'd be entitled to that, not least because your your permission has all the effects in law until it's quashed and um, there's no reason why uh, on those facts there you, you couldn't you couldn't apply that here. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got another question um, is there a challenge to be made against a proposed 49.9 megawatt uh, solar farm that the regulator, i.e. The, the local planning authority, is not capable of properly interrogating the, the m and the &E design? Um, I guess that's an issue about the, the amount of, of detail that's required to determine the application. A anyone want to take that one? I think... Um... I, I think from the subsequent question as well, it's, it's the question is really about the gaming of of thresholds, and certainly it's it is an issue that it, it's it's difficult. I think when you have this cut off for the local planning authority's jurisdiction to um, grant planning permission at, at fifty megawatts, um, it's difficult where you have facilities which, due to their design, may be capable of generating more than that, but have been um, designed in a way which can limit that generation and battery storage is the, uh, is the way in which it's done. I think obviously um, those, those sorts of cases are really a, a jurisdictional issue. If the, if the planning authority uh, grants planning permission for a um, generating station above 50 megawatts, it's straightforward ultra virus. Um, and if it is 49.9 megawatts, it's not, 
and I think it's really goes to that jurisdiction question rather than to a question of expertise for the planning authority but I think the, these issues do uh, start to come in as, uh, as as there are gaming around the thresholds as, as it said I mean whether it's gaming or whether it's just applying for development of particular scale I, I don't know but um, I, I, my view is that it becomes a a question of the virus of the planning authority to grant consent in the first place. It's an interesting issue about capability and future capability. The Stansted JR a couple of years ago grappled with that precisely. Where, where do you set your MPPA limit and what happens if we know in five years time you're going to come back for some more? Um, so the court definitely grappled with those issues that Richard's just discussed in, in that context and, and, the, and the, the 2008 Act. And how, and how do you challenge the jurisdiction? I mean, if you're challenging, if the, if the local planning authority has accepted that it's under 49.9 or under 50, um, do you come forward with technical information, you know, it, it, challenging their assessment of that? And obviously, it, you, normally you wouldn't be able to do that because that would be a matter of planning judgment, what, what the... Um, you know, what, what the uh, type, of, you know, what, what the project is, and how you assess it. But when it's a hard-edged issue of jurisdiction, whether it falls within their jurisdiction or not, um, how does the court? Yeah, you know, Matthew, did that case you mentioned? Did that de did it deal with that that point about the sort of information you can bring forward to the high court to challenge jurisdiction on that basis? No, it didn't. The the, the facts were agreed there, um, mm -hmm. or largely agreed. But I, I suppose you're in a sort of expert evidence law society type. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the first thing you say is the local authority. You say, well, hang on a minute. There's a reasonable dispute between experts, not, not for the high court. Um, yeah, yeah. That's no, interesting. The, the, the reverse dispute happened in a development consent order case called Gate and the Secretary of State for Transport, where um, I said that the Secretary of State had purported, purported to grant development consent for uh, something which wasn't an NSIP. And um, the court, broadly speaking, addressed that as a sort of rationality challenge, um, which of course is, is the sort of way in which you can get around it, yeah. um, rather than a sort of hard edge question of whether this particular bit of road infrastructure was or was not an NSIP. Yeah, I suppose, is it not more of a question of sort of jurisdictional fact? Or when you, I suppose if you portray it like that, they might be more interested in it than, than a straightforward judgment type argument, but pretty difficult perhaps. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, we're we're also asked about um, the the materiality of a, of a good grid connection being available amongst many factors when deter when striking the balance um, in relation to um, what appears to be uh, a solar project. Um, my my own thought on that is that 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 is a material factor. In other words, it's relevant, but the weight, of course, is for the decision maker to determine. In amongst uh, all the other all the other matters, and so whilst you have to take into account how important that is, uh, I think it may depend on the circumstances of the case, which is a very lawyer's answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, there's in the um, certainly in some of the recent cases that I've seen um, the sort of site selection assessment and alternatives assessment when you're looking at justifying any impacts on best and most versatile agricultural land i think have all proceeded on the basis that the grid connection opportunity provides some sort of constraint so you have to look within yeah. the available grid connection area um, but obviously that depends a bit on what you're connecting to and for what purpose um, so some of the smaller planning appeal schemes are um, connecting to the distribution network and uh, there's only going to be um, sort of limited opportunities but when you're looking at more um, utility scale solar connections um, then there's a decision there's the whole uh, decision making process around grid connection offers and, and and the detail of that and the various opportunities and whether there are grid reinforcements that can facilitate future solar connections etc and also the viability of, of longer cable connections, meaning you can search further and further away from those grid connection opportunities. So it becomes a bit more complex. Um, and I think that sort of leads in the, the, one of the issues in, in the Aquind case as well about alternatives and how far the grid connection offer narrows the scope of what you need to consider when it comes to 
um, alternatives and so on. Thanks, that, that's really helpful. Um, we've been asked about whether any of us are aware of a Secretary of State decision uh, under the Town and Country Planning Act, refusing sol a solar farm with a capacity of less than 50 megawatts. Anybody know anything off the top of their heads? Stuff. I, I, that makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> so, Not off the top of my head. Um, there's quite a lot of recent decisions, but I've most, lots of them have been at inspector level at least. Yeah. yeah, that's my experience anyway, mostly inspectors I've dealt with. I'm afraid you need, need to know the answer to that one desperately. You're going to have to instruct somebody and come to Chambers for that one so we can do the research. Um, with the, the next uh, question we're asked is about a, a Secretary of State decision on the island gas um, uh, application. Any comments about the refusal, which was in part based on the unmitigated proportion of greenhouse gas emissions conflicting with? One five two of the MPPF. Is that a decision anyone's familiar with? I'm afraid I've not read that one. No, I'm not not familiar with the decision. I'm afraid. Um, yeah. Always always safe not to comment then. Um, yeah, somebody's pointing out on the threshold discussion that we had before. You could always seek a direction under section thirty five, um, which might be the safest thing for a local authority to do actually. Um, uh, there's a question about um, about BESS, any cases about grants and planning from the DCO over approval relating to BESS infrastructure. Um, not that I've seen expressly. Not to say. I mean, there's quite a lot that's being consented. Um, yeah. So um, I think in the in the Little Crow, uh, solar farm DCA, which is I think the most recent Secretary of State decision to grant a solar DCA. Uh, there's BESS uh, provided for, um, and I think safety is has sort of been raised by various objectors um, at that one. I think perhaps in in earlier um, solar proposals as well. Um, so far, at least. Uh, as I've read it, I haven't seen any case where best proposals have been refused on um, safety grounds. But um, I think it's fair to say from the Secretary of State's decision making, and, and I think as probably as a matter of planning law, that um, uh, public safety matters may well be a material planning consideration for the Secretary of State or the local planning authority when it comes to those things and things like fire plans and so on may be um, material planning considerations rather than just being a matter to be left over to um, you know later later controls and the position of the of the fire authority in terms of how it would fight a battery fire um, if, if there was one are going to be perhaps relevant as well and whether there are any objections from the, from the local uh, relevant fire authority um, so I think definitely material planning consideration I haven't seen any instance in which it's been a determinative material planning consideration yes yeah that's what I was thinking about it's, it's fairly good analogy with energy from waste and the way that safety and health impacts are dealt with there those sort those sort those types of arguments are raised fairly often there and it's, and it's well settled and well trodden how, how inspectors approach it in that context so it seems to me to apply fairly equally here yeah thanks Okay, um, I think the last point that we've got at the moment in the in the questions is again back to this issue about whether you're under the 50 megawatt threshold for your solar farm, and um, the points made. Well, uh, is it is it relevant when considering the issue whether the system with batteries, which is the 49.9, has greater impact? In other words, for example, a bigger land area footprint. Than a 50 megawatt system without the batteries. Um, what are your thoughts about whether the extent to which the, the relative impact is relevant in determining jurisdiction? It's a. Um, I, I don't think it is relevant. It's uh, the threshold that's been set in the 2008 Act is set by reference to generating capacity, and actually, the the way in which this interacts with with storage is that there's a effectively an exemption. Um, 
from the threshold for for the, the storage capacity of the of the generating station. Um, so I think it's right to say that you can end up with a facility that may well have um, be much much larger than a fifty megawatt um, system without without battery storage. Um, but the law has set a threshold of, of 50 megawatt generating um, uh, generating capacity and um, that's that's how it's set so so if it is being if the project's being altered so that it stays below that then it's being altered so it stays below that and and as I said that it becomes a binary once you're above the threshold you must seek development consent and you may not seek planning permission and when you're below it you may not seek development consent and if you want to build it you must seek planning permission yeah i say that that reflects my own understanding from last year of, of, of the relevance of impact it, it's just not a relevant matter uh, and it is as you say it's simply a, a question is it is it 50 megawatts or above or is it below i think that's that's an interesting point that by analogy with finch um the <clears throat> the definition of um the project for EIA purposes um, is extraction of petroleum for commercial purposes. And I think it's a, a, at a particular level, but the, um, the dissenting judgment in the Court of Appeal, which said that you know, the end product of the oil extraction, so the burning of the petrol should be assessed um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Lord Justice Mollion said, well, because it's described, the project's described as extraction of oil for commercial purposes, and because the threshold is about that extraction of oil, the intention behind the EIA directive and regulations is that it's that, um, that the project described in that way, and it's and it's the essence, that's the essence of it, the commercial purposes of the extraction and the future use of the oil is part of the project, and for that reason, those emissions should be assessed under, under the EIA re regime, which is an interesting position to take. And I think um, you know, it, it actually directly deals with Mr. Justice Holgate's um, argument, which was that you, you look at the project itself. He's saying, well, yeah, but you look at, if you look at the actual wording and how it's defined in the regulations, that includes the commercial purposes for which the oil is extracted. Um, and so you know, that, that kind of focuses the mind on what you should be assessing. Um, and its implications. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting how these things are defined and how the, the implications that can have, I think, on, on what you look at in assessing them. It'd be interesting to see if the Supreme Court, if, 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 you know, if an appeal goes to the Supreme Court in relation to Finch and picks up on that type of argument. Okay, great. Um, I don't think we've got any outstanding questions so unless somebody's going to type one in rapidly um, I'm going to draw things to a, a, a close and so thank you all for uh, coming and uh, for your your time in, in uh, listening to our webinar we, we hope it's been useful uh, as I said before you will be getting a link very shortly to the recording and indeed to the presentation slides as well uh, so thanks to Jenny Richard and Matthew for their their, um, their papers and their hopeful discussion and hopefully we'll see you all again soon at another landmark webinar in the near future goodbye